Thank you for letting me know. Stephen Brown. We have a very busy day today, so we're going to push through this. Um, I do want to say we have a, ve a very special uh, guest today of Bee Creek Swim Team. Um, I actually didn't know this, but I knew Chris from volleyball. I did not realize this till last week. Um, so excited he was make was able to make it today because he does work at Fairborn uh, City Schools. Um, he said he wished he could work at Beaver Creek. I wish we had someone here in this rotary meeting that could possibly hook that up. Uh, and also, thank you uh, to all of our guests that are here. Um, I'd like to thank our greeters, of course, Ed and Fran O'Shaughnessy, Eric Marcus for being our ticket master, Mike Swick, Pete Bales, and Mark Weinstein for our great programs, Jim Gunnell and Alex O'Hara for our website in YouTube. Uh, at this moment, I'd like to invite Denny Darby up for the invocation. Good 
afternoon, would you please join me in prayer? Holy Creator, we ask your saving grace abide with those people in the Ukraine. We pray for the Ukrainian Rotarians as they try to help people during this terrible war. We thank you for the opportunity to serve our community and the world beyond. Thank you for this great food and for our camaraderie as we break bread together. Amen. Thank you very much. Secretary's report, David Cusack, we're putting you to work today. All right. Um, I would ask our superintendent, Weber Paul Austin, to introduce the bevy of guests. Uh, yes, got a number of guests here today. I won't introduce this group because they'll be introduced in a little bit. But just going around our table, Dale Wren is our high school principal. Jeff Mann yeah. is our uh, director of student services. Yeah. Joanne Regano, board president. Joanne. Greg Thompson, business manager. Annika Bushman is our public relations director. Welcome. Chris Nielsen is also here. Uh, he's with the team. He's our head coach. Uh, All right. Representative Lampton has a couple of guests. Thank you, sir. My uh, my beautiful and lovely, talented fiance, Karen, is with me. Hello, Karen. Hey, Karen. And I'm very fortunate to, to announce that I have a brand new office manager starting Monday. Just uh, agreed to work with me uh, last night. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> In a prospect for writer. Nice to meet you. That's why I'm smiling today. So yeah. I'm to work it for my friend. Trying to eat. And, uh, I have Jesse Jones with us, and uh, she's here um, because, of course, she's almost a Rotarian. She's so much a part of Rotary, but also because she's her captain. Uh, happens to have her grandson here. So. Uh, Always welcome. I think all our other guests will be introduced as part of it. I can start my vice president in the Okay, so our first introduction is the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, our attendance is a period of close over 60. All right, thank you very much. Uh, in lieu of the Sergeant at Arms report, um, we're going to actually have, uh, yeah, there's a clap right there. Um, we're going to have actually Paul Otten, he's getting ready to walk out, um, come up here, uh, as well as Mayor Stone. Um, this is pretty neat. Uh, I'm guessing, yep, Dean Creek News Current. So we have the uh, team on here. And I just want to point out Tobias Feener Homes is on the bottom with an ad. And uh, of course, he's one of our Dean Creek Rotarians. So. Well, uh, first of all, I just want to thank everybody. Uh, did you want to start first? Oh, you go right ahead. Well, I was, I was going to introduce this. Group. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to do is I know Mr. Wren has his uh, knife in his hand and his fork. Um, I, I just want to ask Dale to come up and our head coach, Chris Nielsen, to come up. And I want Dale just to give some indication of the vibe of this group of kids. Uh, I know they've gotten a lot of pictures with Dale over the years. And now I think he's going to turn it over to Chris uh, to bring up our kids. Good afternoon. Um, obviously, we're all right in the line there. Um, it is a great group of young men. Um, I'm the principal. I'm not in the classroom, so I don't get the day to day, but I, I do get the anecdotal observations of them at lunch and them at extracurriculars. And you can definitely see the camaraderie um, as this season built and even starting last year. Um, they show up to leave that day and they're all in these bright orange coats um these really nice and good amazon they're not super expensive but um that was kind of the first indication that these guys are a little bit different and they made some great accomplishments last year and then it just really flowed right into this year and if, if you're ever in our athletic lobby we kind of have what looks like a giant street sign with all of our state champions indicated in the years and they were just kind of hovering around it before the bus left and i was looking at that sign thinking it's full so boys we're going to have to get a new sign that's at least a couple inches longer so you can put it uh put your name on there you always be able to come back and show your kids and say hey 
That's what my old man did back in 2022. So great group of kids. Okay. All right. Um, boys, do you guys want to come up and join us for a little bit? Introduce you real quick. I'm going to take this from my kids. We just had our banquet on Monday and they were all reading their notes off their phones. I'm trying to be high tech. Um, for those of you guys that don't know me, my name is Chris Melissa. Um, I teach adaptive PD in Fairborn, which is why I'm dressed like this. Um, I, my principal was nice enough to let me sneak out for lunch. Um, so we have uh, all my boys here. Um, it was a great season. I can get my uh, phone to go the right way here. That would be great. Um, this is my fifth year as head coach for Beaver Creek High School. Um, it's been an exciting five years. But this one really is kind of like taking the, uh, you know, us to the next level. Um, this year was definitely one for the record of the books. Uh, this group of young men completely exceeded all of my expectations this season. Um, the journey began with our senior boys. They said that uh, they told their club coaches and their parents and myself that they were going to win the um, state this year, and they did. Um, this is why I don't use my phone because it's not a little bit nice. <laughs> um, so, a couple things this year. Um, Ohio has one of the fastest swimmers in the country. Um, and uh, I started to believe when the kids came within 50 points of beating St. X at Coach's Classic. Um, that's when they really started to turn heads. Um, nobody had been that close in about 30 years. Um, they also represented well at GWAP. They tied Central for first. Um, but that said, uh, we had a significant smaller group of swimmers than they had, so it was very impressive. Um, and then the combination of the season ended with a historic state win. The boys left everything they had in the pool. They had an incredible prelims and an even more impressive finals. Again, we had less numbers than most of the other teams had there, um, but they were determined and set their goals on a state victory. It ended up coming down to some key swims in our 400 free relay. The boys were in the water warming up and they asked if they had a chance to still win. Um, like I said, we were six points down going into the 400 free. We needed to get first to win um, and St. X had to get third or fourth for the solo win. If they got second, then we would have tied for state champs. Um, St. X ended up getting fourth. The boys ended up dropping over a second and a half, which if you know swimming, um, that's really hard to do, especially for a four and a three relay after they had already dropped a ton of time. So that was really, really awesome. Um, so the whole thing was surreal. Um, this was the first time a public school had won since 1987. I was 14 years old when that happened. Uh, that says anything. Um, we also broke a 22 year streak by St. X, um, which they're a swimming juggernaut in Ohio. Um, pretty much with all sports, but swimming, they like people just go to next to swim, and they're really hard to beat. So um, the boys got first out of 51 schools uh, representing Ohio. And those are just the schools that make it. a lot of our schools um, in Ohio didn't even have anyone representing. Um, these guys are very talented swimmers, but better individuals. They show that on a daily basis at school, at home. Um, they represent this program really well. Uh, I can't wait to see what they do with their future endeavors. Um, I've been coaching for 28 years, and this will always be a fond memory for me. Um, and it's been an absolute honor to be one of your coaches. I also wanted to shout out to the girls team because they supported these guys throughout the season. They got 13th out of 49 schools, and um, that's a pretty huge feat, too, because their numbers were pretty small as well. Um, just a couple of highlights real quick. Um, the girls and boys broke 14 school records this year, which was insane. I'm not going to read them all off to you, but they uh, were incredible. Um, so uh, if I could get a round of applause for these boys, and I'll let them. Um, um, I'm Dylan Edge, uh, a senior this year, and I'll be going to the University of Notre Dame next year. Uh, I'm Anthony Braun. I'm a sophomore, so I don't really have any schools picked up right now. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Benjamin Dunhack. Um, I'm also a sophomore, so I still have two more years of swimming in high school. Hi, I'm Ryan. I'm a junior, and I haven't picked out a college yet. 
Hi guys, my name is Ethan Otten, and uh, I'm at Shrubby Tennant University of Alabama. Uh, <laughs> my name is Luke from Confusion, and I am a hundred best friend. My name is Luke Sullivan, and I'm also going to Bama. <laughs> my name is Michael Ryan, I'm a senior, and I'll be attending the University of Pittsburgh. I'm Caleb Manning, I'm a sophomore, and I enjoy distance. <laughs> I want to say thank you very much for um, honoring the boys today. Um, it was a great season, and we're looking forward to next year. Chris, can you check your bus ride? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we were driving to state. Uh, everybody's super stressed. We're just kind of like, you know, everybody should be thinking about nothing but finals. And we had a long couple of days, prelims, practices, warm ups, just you name it. Um, so we're driving to finals. Boys are focused on the state win and doing their best. And we're pulling off the exit. And I have my earphones on and I have my head kind of down, thinking about like how I'm going to get them amped up and ready to go. And we stop at the stoplight at the bottom of the off ramp. And I hear a couple of boys yell from the back of the bus. Hey, Chris, can we beat the homeless guy? And I'm like, all right. So we put on our flashers. The guy came over. They gave him a couple sandwiches, uh, a couple bottles of water, some other food, some muffins and stuff. And uh, it really lightened the mood. The mood. Um, it just shows you, like, we have so many talented swimmers up here, um, but they're even better people. And it just really kind of, like, set the tone for the whole day. Um, got my mind where it needed to be, and we moved forward. But... Um, yeah, these guys deserve some mad props. It was, it was an interesting story for sure. So. All right. Well, thank you, Coach, very much. And I was told I need to move over this way. Oh, oh you guys can stay. You guys stay here. Oh, yes, please. Uh, just so that we can get in the camera. Now, a couple things before I get started, and that. Uh, there's obviously a very proud superintendent and proud father in the room today. So, Paul, congratulations to you as well. Uh, and I do want to tell you, fellas, that you know you create a lot of work for us at the city by coming in first. <laughs> now we've got to redo our signs. And I think you've all seen the signs around Beaver Creek that all list all the first place uh, uh, competitions. And so we're very proud of that. And we plan to have you at City Hall on the 25th of April, and we will have those signs available then. And really do a one on one presentation for you. But today, I knew you were going to be here, so I was asked to do a proclamation for the team. And I'm not going to try to read all this. You've got a lot of great history from the coach. And uh, but I do want to just read a couple things here. And uh, as you heard, this team is made up of four seniors, three juniors, and three sophomores. So we have more than half the team going to be back next year. So, you know, ex expectations are high. Uh, but, you know, this team, through dedication and hard work, for the first time ever, brought the Division I state championship to Beaver Creek. So a round of applause for that. But to be formal about this, fellas, the proclamation states that I, Bob Stone, mayor of the city of Beaver Creek, along with the entire city council, several of them here this, this, this afternoon, do hereby extend our congratulations to the Beaver Creek High School Boys Swim Team. So, fellas, if we can get a picture with this, and I want to give this to the coach, because you're going to get your individual ones on the 25th, all right? All right. Somebody All right, count of three here. One, two, three. Look over here, Mayor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Anything you'd like to say? Anybody want to say anything like that? I'm going to turn it over to the proud superintendent. Go quick, Steve. I just wanted to close it out. Uh, one item that I will leave with, first of all, these are great kids, um, but our coach was also named Coach of the Year uh, for Ohio, so congratulations. Yeah. 
keep there's still some food on your plates, boys, so you can go ahead and try to enjoy. Thank you very much. Congratulations uh, again. Hey, I can't forget to introduce the guest with whom I work on the Family Violence Prevention Center for uh, a guest of Rick Morales. Oh, Becca. Yeah. Becca. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Dave. All right, here. Let's do a uh, happy bucks real quick. Anybody have a happy buck? Gussie. Um, I'm not a Rotarian. Um, I kind of feel like I am, but I'm not. You are. Um, I've watched these boys grow up. They have turned into wonderful young men. We should be very proud. They've gotten good education in school. They've gotten good coaching. Chris would have been wonderful. They've gotten good parents. Um, I'm proud of every one of them. Especially my grandson. <laughs> <laughs> up to the program club for announcing and for honoring them. And one last thing on Owen's place, we have a wonderful donation from the Lafino grandchildren that will enable us to put in a wheelchair swing for two individuals and two typical individuals to ride at the same time. So thank wow, you. That's great. <laughs> Just when you thought the project was over. Yeah, right. Dave? I have a happy buck, and I'd like to say thank you to Paul Lott for developing and helping create a terrific school system here in Beaver Creek. Absolutely. No offense, Paul, but I wouldn't want your job. <laughs> I have a happy buck. Good morning. I have a happy buck. Thanks for watching. All right. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, yeah. I have a happy buck. <laughs> I'm glad to be Brian's office. Too. There you go. <laughs> it's early. <laughs> <laughs> Steve and I have a happy buck. This is from Bill Lipman, who was a 1989 graduate of Beaver Creek High School, swam the whole time he was in junior high and high school, and he said, Congratulations. <laughs> Last weekend, uh, I had uh, I attended the wedding of my fifth grandchild to get married, and next month I go to North Carolina and attend the wedding of my sixth grandchild. <laughs> All right, congratulations. Jen? Uh, so, I'm going to give a happy five bucks. Um, I got a couple things to throw in there on. Uh, so for the past three weeks, uh, Brett, the guy that works with me, we've been volunteering for Habitat for Humanity. We finally got wrapped up on uh, a gentleman with disability who's got to tear out his old bathtub and put him in a shower that he could actually use. He hasn't taken a shower in a year. So uh, he, was, he was pretty happy to get that. Uh, number two, uh, I will be here next week because I will be at Ryla camp. So, All right. uh, happy to have another week out of camp and, uh, always a good bunch of people. We got, uh, 58 kids registered for now and there's only a couple left in the registration. So Ryla camp is pretty awesome. Uh, number three, uh, I want to give a happy buck for Scott Hadley. Uh, I know Scott is not here. I know he's, he's listening online. to us out there. In the Matrix, um, uh, Scott has had some complications with diabetes and lost a portion of the toe. Uh, so he's been in recovery, and he gets to come home next week, which that's pretty awesome. So that's yeah. great. <laughs> Thank you. Alex. I got two happy bucks. First, uh, I was in a meeting Tuesday night, unfortunately, uh, with some other Rotarians. Beat, beat. Um, Rick and Nick, and you know, unfortunately, we were listening to the county engineer talk about great stuff. But I was glued to my phone watching the <laughs> state game. Um, he was on one side of me telling me the score, he was on the other side of me saying, Hey, they just scored a three. Or, oh, <laughs> so I left the game, leave, left the meeting thinking we were going to lose, but they came back and won. Was up the right state. Uh, second happy buck is my daughter, as you know, is a biologist from the state of Florida. 
Uh, she just moved to the EPA and just got a promotion in her own office. Wow, cool. congratulations. This is how much I love Rotary. I'm actually supposed to be with the right state men's basketball team right now. So, uh, but yeah, I'd much rather be here, but huge congrats to them. Uh, anyone else? Perfect. I got one. Uh, my sister, who's a nurse at Tampa General, uh, transitioned to a traveling nurse. So she'll be in Cincinnati for two months. Uh, so glad to have her back here in Ohio. So, uh, winning ticket number 9904. So just, we had a lot of visitors today. We do a raffle every meeting um, and half of that, uh, the winner or winner of the raffle, half of it goes to our annual Christmas basket where we go around Beaver Creek and uh, feed families that need it. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, you won, oh, great. You gotta pick a card still. If you get a joker, you can put five more in. <laughs> all right hot rose all right let's uh go ahead and move forward here just a heads up if the meeting does run past one you're uh, more welcome to leave uh we won't uh cast any stones on you uh but the, they have a lot of information we'd like to get through it so again uh if it's past one you need to leave uh go ahead and we won't be writing names down uh, Mike Twig, will you want to come up and introduce our speakers today? So you guys can have your time. <laughs> Dr. Glenn Dewar, Dr. Mark, Mark Caleb Smith, please come talk. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate everyone having me today. Uh, my name is Glenn Dua from Cedarville University. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mark Weinstein, Mike Zwick, and Pete Bales for the invitation uh, for having me today. Uh, also, as the, the father of three Beaver Creek uh, City Schools kids, uh, I'd like to thank the swim team because uh, our kids are into swimming at Dayton Rangers Club. And uh, there's a real something to look up to here. So appreciate your work. and. Um, it's really been a big boost to the community. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk today about a very serious subject, and that is uh, Russia's illegal and brutal invasion of Ukraine. But I think it's uh, useful to think through uh, the positions of Vladimir Putin, uh, what he's doing and why he's doing it. Because in our, uh, in our press, in our media, it can seem like he's a madman, and he is. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's useful to have some context and some background uh, through which to think as well. So if we start with a, a map, it's worth noting a, a, a few just factual pieces of information. Uh, first, Russia is the world's largest country by far. It encompasses 11 time zones. So think about just doing business from the East Coast of the United States to the West Coast. And then almost doubling that you know, in a sense. Uh, the population is a little under 150 million. Uh, Ukraine, a neighboring country, is here. It gained its independence in 1991. Uh, and its population is around 42 million. And there's a long and deep history that runs between the two. And I'll try and disentangle a bit of that. Bear in mind that uh, for virtually every two minutes I'm talking, um, when I teach my history and politics of Russia and Eastern Europe class, it easily becomes an hour for each of the two minutes. That's just a very dense history. And even then, I'm only really scratching the surface. So who is this man? Uh, is he a madman? Is he the next Hitler? Uh, is he a war criminal? Uh, the International Criminal Court opened an investigation on him. Uh, is he a defender of Russians? Is he a protector of the Russian Orthodox Church? Uh, is he several of these things? Is he all of them? Uh, these are questions worth bearing in mind. He turned 70 this year and a uh, former KGB man that was really uh, mid-level in intelligence in Russia. No major commendations. 
no places where he really stood out, uh, but then entered the mayoral office in St. Petersburg or Horse, uh, Leningrad, and uh, gained the favor of then President Boris Yeltsin of the Russian Federation. He was elevated to the position of prime minister at the end of 1999. Yeltsin uh, had a number of health issues. Putin ran for the 2000 presidential election, won when Russia was probably still reasonably democratic, and has been there ever since. So many of our swim team members, they've only ever known uh, Vladimir Putin in power in Russia. Uh, someone that's 23 years old has only ever known uh, Russia with Vladimir Putin. It's also important to think through how many Russians view the world, including Vladimir Putin. One of the strongest suits of our country is that we're always looking forward. Uh, I have this funny accent, but I have uh, grandparents uh, from Detroit, Michigan, uh, that uh, would spoil me rotten. And so every time I came to the United States, I thought, wow, this amazing country where you get to eat all these buffets and go to, um, uh, you know, Disney World and things of that nature. And, and the idea there being that we're constantly trying to make the country better and better for the next generation and the next generation. Um, in a lot of uh, European countries, Asian countries in particular, there's also a, a deep history where people look back uh, and sometimes over a thousand years. Uh, and so you have this double headed eagle here uh, that, that gives that connotation. Um, and so if we go to this map, this is a map of the beginning of what is today Russia. It's a territory called Kievan Rus. And it's one th roughly 1,150 years old. And for Vladimir Putin, he views this as the cradle, uh, the birthplace of his civilization. And as you may have heard in the name, it's around the capital city of Monday, Ukraine, Kiev. So the two are very, very closely connected. This is a country that expanded, uh, prospered to some degree, but then was conquered by the Mongols in 1233. Those Mongols then stayed for longer than we, the United States, have been a country. They stayed for around 250 years until the decline of the Mongol Empire and then the exit. And so we have the rebirth of what became the Sardom of Russia and then the Russian Empire, what was known as the Grand Duchy of Moscovy or the Grand Duchy of Moscow, uh, especially in 1533. And if you look at the darker green, it's where the uh, territory originated and then expanded. And so for Vladimir Putin, he wrote an essay last summer that was published, 5,000 words, arguing that Ukraine Ukrainians and Russians are inextricably connected together uh, and they cannot be separated. Uh, this map shows a, a distinction where Ukrainians were not under Russian rule. And it's worth noting that there is a distinct uh, Ukrainian language and history and culture uh, in all that, despite what Vladimir Putin claims. Russia's history is full of expansion and contraction significant military victories, but then also great times of loss, which also factors into Putin's thinking both forward and backwards. And so for Vladimir Putin, we may call him a madman, and again, he is. Uh, we can call him a human rights abuser, and he is. But there's a rationale behind his thinking. And that is that the, uh, the, the Russian Empire has been invaded on five different occasions from the West across the Northern Plains of Europe. Uh, and I have a quick tally on the board here, but um, you have the Commonwealth of Poland, Lithuania in 1610 that conquered the Grand Duchy of Moscovy and occupied Moscow for three years. Imagine a foreign power taking Washington DC and holding it for three years. It also uh, coincided with what's known as a time of the troubles we're in following the death of Ivan the Terrible. It's a longer story, but the line of succession failed to the point where the Rurik dynasty that had been in place since the 19th century, sorry, the 9th century, 
collapsed and we have the beginnings of the Romanovs with Sir Michael Romanov. You may have heard of Nicholas II, the last Romanov. That line lasted from 1613 to 1917. So that's part of the Russian psyche of being uh, invaded from the West and defeated in that case. The Swedes did it uh, during the Great Northern War, that is during the time of Peter the Great, and likewise got to the gates of Moscow before uh, losing uh, Peter the Great, then set up St. Petersburg, uh, the second most prominent city in Russia today. We have Napoleon as part of uh, a massive set of uh, um, conflicts in Europe, starting really in 1793, but we have the invasion uh, of Russia in 1812 by the Grand Army, and that too gets all the way to the gates of Moscow. Some 700,000 men in an army, only 50,000, sorry, 50,000 returned. We then have the Russian Civil War, uh, in the aftermath of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. It was one of three revolutions in Russia, but likewise, it was a significant time of occupation. We, the United States, sent 13,000 troops to Russia. We lost 600 soldiers in Russia uh, during this time. Uh, it's not typically taught in, the, in US history, uh, but it, is, it, it plays a role in this. And then finally, we can think of Hitler in, in 1941. So it's not to excuse Vladimir Putin in any way, shape, or form, but it's to say that's the context. That's the backdrop. And so for Russia, in its psyche, it wants a buffer zone from the West because of all these invasions, whether rational or not. That is their position and background. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, another tangential point. When Russia is hit, they also have a long memory for revenge. Poland invaded them in 1610. By the time we get to 1795, Poland's gone from the map. There's a revenge that takes place. They only come back to life in 1918. And then uh, following World War II in 1945, they're then still under uh, the, the Iron Curtain. Uh, but it's worth bearing that in mind. The idea of revenge is another big one. And so if we go to the end of World War II, we think about the greatest generation uh, who fought Nazism, Imperial Japan, uh, very much paved the world for liberty, uh, constitutional rights, uh, the free market, all the things we enjoy now in the United States. We have this unfortunate uh, separation and we have the Soviet Union that then takes significant parts of, of Europe, including the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. And you can see uh, on red the map of the Soviet Union, including the modern day boundaries of countries like Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, Belarus, and then the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. But beyond that, we have the Iron Curtain, the distinction of, of two Europes, one that's free, uh, and has a significant liberty, the other that's communist and not. And you can see uh, several countries from Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, uh, East Germany, uh, that are behind this iron curtain and this idea of a, of a buffer zone that's been put in place. Many of you will, will, will remember the stalling Soviet economy while it had some successes in the 1950s and the 1970s began to stumble, seize up, and many of you will remember terms like glasnost and perestroika, where they were trying to change in order to um, allow their economy to free up. It's also worth mentioning during this time that the Soviets were brutal uh, in different areas. There is a, uh, a highly contested famine uh, that also coincides as a genocide, Holodomor from the early 1930s, wherein Stalin starved to death Ukrainians. By the way, Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. Massive amounts of wheat and barley and rye come from this area, and they were starved in the millions to death. Maybe 4 million, maybe 5, maybe upwards of 10 million were starved to death by Stalin's policies. It's controversial, but it's also worth mentioning that Ukrainians rebelled at a previous point in history, and then this point of revenge came back. 
Uh, in Hungary in 1956, uh, the tanks were sent in by the Soviets. Czechoslovakia in 1968. Uh, and so when you see images right now of people in Prague in the hundreds of thousands protesting in support of the Ukrainians, they remember the tanks and their own streets. Many of you will remember some of those images. To a lesser extent, it happened in Poland in 1981. But then we also have a, another time of the troubles. Many of you will remember Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, uh, trying to reform the Soviet Union. Massive protests in a range of different countries, in the millions, in the Baltic states, in Ukraine, uh, in um, Kazakhstan as, as well as a big one where it started. And then we had the dissolution of the Soviet Union in December of 1991. What well, started out as one country, the Soviet Union, splintering into 15. And for Vladimir Putin, he has called this the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. So just take a step back and think about what that means. For Putin, the breakup of the Soviet Union was worse than World War II, where the Soviets lost somewhere between 20 and 25 million people. It was worse than the Holocaust. It was worse than World War I. It was worse than the Rwandan genocide. He calls it the greatest tragedy of the century. And that's worth noting as well. And so we have this map that you've seen already today. Russia is still by far the largest country in the world, but now the Soviet Union is 15 pieces. And so what is Putin trying to do? Is he trying to put this back together? Is he trying to create a greater Russia where some pieces will be left, but ethnic Russians will be in a larger country? It's hard to get inside his mindset, but it certainly helps to explain his military actions at this stage. So what's next for Ukraine? Unfortunately, a lot of it is, is not good. Uh, when Putin was prime minister under Boris Yeltsin, he initiated the second war on Chechnya, Chechnya being a small region of Southwestern Russia that is predominantly Sunni Muslim and has a long history of wanting to be outside of Russia. You can see from the, this map here, it's a small area and it neighbors Georgia that used to be part of the Soviet Union. But in effect, the first war with Chechnya began in 1994. There was a quick Russian victory, but then an insurgency and a dipping of morale to the point where the Russians exited and Chechnya, Chechnya was largely de facto independent. Putin comes, to, comes back and opts to carpet bomb. Level cities throughout Chechnya. Some of the grossest human rights violations. And so unfortunately, that is a possibility for Ukraine. He installed a puppet regime, Ahmad Kadyrov. His son, Ramzan, still runs Chechnya as effectively their equivalent of governor. He then engaged in further military action in the country of Georgia, taking pieces of Abkhazia and South Ossetia that you see on the map here. This is Abkhazia, this is South Ossetia. Not ethnically Russian, but not ethnically Georgian either. And declares them independent as, as a situation, but effectively annexed to Russia. We then have the annexation of Crimea, and notably the important naval port of Sebastopol on the Black Sea. This happens in 2014. It's illegal, it's against international law, but he gets away with it. And then we also see the uh, sending in of Russian troops without military insignia into the Eastern region, regions of Donetsk and Luhansk in this part of Eastern Ukraine. And so that's the backdrop of a lot of the conflict. We then see military action in Syria. Uh, Russia ends up carpet bombing uh, significant parts of parts of Syria, notably Idlib province in here, 
and then capturing the bases of Tardus, a naval base on the Mediterranean, and an air base just outside of Latakia. So Russia, even in this last decade, has expanded pretty massively under the radar without many people noticing. He's engaged in massive bombings, leveling cities in places like Grizzly, but also in Syria, where we kind of have turned away thinking, well, it's a Syrian civil war, it's happening over there. But unfortunately, these are blueprints that he's now repeating in Ukraine. And as you can see, I'll go to this one here. Uh, portions of Ukraine are being taken uh, illegally uh, in contravention to international law. Uh, and it's a brutal situation. And so please keep the Ukrainians in your prayers. I've tried to keep this short. There's a lot more happy to answer questions in the Q&A session. Uh, but Dr. Smith, please. So, oh. yeah. so I am not an expert in international relations. This is my, I don't have a fancy accent, like <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do, do American politics primarily, and I'm going to talk about the conflict from the perspective of the Biden presidency and how the conflict is affecting the presidency, as well as how he's limited and how he can respond uh, because of his immediate political context. So, you get some slides going up here in a moment. Um, as a as a Generation X person, this all feels pretty familiar, right? I mean, you know, if you grew up in a certain in a certain climate, um, nothing that we're hearing right now is all that much different than what we were used to before. Thank you. So inflation, that massive spikes of inflation. For those of you that remember. Late 1970s, early 1980s, we saw a significant inflation. Russia is back as a significant geopolitical issue. Uh, I think a lot of people just sort of uh, assume that Russia had receded to the point where they were no longer a significant threat. Of course, there's that famous exchange in the 2012 presidential debate between Romney and Obama over Russia being a significant threat. Uh, but Russia is clearly back. The threat of nuclear annihilation. And for people who grew up after the Berlin Wall fell, they haven't existed with this thought in mind that it's possible that a nuclear war could devastate significant parts of the globe. And for people like my children, it's a fairly shattering thought to come to immediately. They've just never been exposed to it. For people like me, well, this is just sort of how we grew up. It was just the nature of things. If we're lucky, Maybe 80s fashion will come back as well. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're the male persuasion, maybe you're more of a members only jacket sort of guy. <laughs> um, if, if we're lucky, maybe 80s fashion will return. We can only pray. So if we look at this in terms of presidential approval, we often see after significant foreign policy crisis that the president gets a bump in support. So you're looking here at different presidential approvals from the previous recent presidents. Uh, President Trump is here on the bottom, this blue dash. President Biden is in the green line here. Uh, this is President Obama. And then this one is President Bush, George W. Bush. So far, President Biden has not seen really a significant uptick in support you know, due to what we're looking at right now in Ukraine. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. We'll talk about, about some of those. But so far, you haven't seen a dramatic increase. Of course, here's President Bush, 9-11 happens, and you see a massive support for the president as a result of 9-11. Again, different crises, different situations, uh, but we haven't seen anything equivalent, at least so far. So what are his challenges, as we think about President Biden addressing this, what are his challenges? The first one I think is obviously the massive amount of inflation that we're looking at that we really haven't seen for a generation. And this is the kind of problem, as you know, that you encounter every day. It's like COVID. It's just there. You go to the grocery store, it's there. You fill up your gas tank, it's there. You buy an appliance, you buy a car. That inflation is there. You can't really get away from it. 
Given that the nature of this conflict also involves a supply of oil and gas, we see the possibility of a multiplicative effect of a reduced supply. So if gas and oil are reduced in supply, expect prices to go up even more because shipping of everything is relying on oil and gas. And so inflation could see another spike if we see restriction in the amount of oil and gas supply, which I think politically speaking, limits what President Biden might be able to do. He's got 2022 elections he's looking at in November. He's thinking of what kind of economic shock can we survive as a country? Is it gonna doom his party's chances in November? It's all, I think, a reasonable question. There's also this Afghanistan residue. The last time that we saw American soldiers involved in any significant way, we were leaving a country. It wasn't a pretty leaving event. The tail tucked between our legs, people stranded there. And so there's a sort of negative image, I think, that we have right now of American military intervention that's sort of still hanging over a significant part of our country. Now, this gets a little bit delicate, but I think we have to address it if we're going to be fair to what's going on right now. President Biden is projecting, he's, he, he's struggling to project a positive public image. I'm putting that as, as nicely as I can. If you watch the State of the Union address, President Biden has a hard time performing in public. He's not speaking as well as he used to. He's really not doing difficult situations with media where he's having to take hard questions all that often. The problem with that is during a time of crisis, people want to see strong, effective, decisive leadership. And right now, President Biden, as a public persona, is not up to putting that image forward. Now, it could very well be that behind the scenes, he's being decisive. Could be, could be that he's really not in mental decline of any kind. He's having a hard time articulating. We don't know. But whether we like to admit it or not, an important part of leadership in the 21st century is the ability to show yourself a certain way in public. He can't do that. It may be an unfair comparison, but contrast that with President Zelensky. Public all the time, speaking, he's in combat fatigues. This is projecting a particular image that's good for the entire world to some degree. At the same time, America, uh, the leader of the free world historically, is not able to project that sort of image. And so President Biden I think, suffers as a result of the comparison. Another problem I think he has is that this foreign policy crisis is relatively ambiguous for Americans. We are not directly involved. NATO is not directly involved. We haven't been attacked like we were attacked on 9-11. I think you can argue, and I'm sure Glenn would have a lot to say, that maybe this event is gonna be as important as 9-11 in terms of affecting geopolitics. But since we're not directly involved, the president's having a harder time, I think, expressing what he wants to do to the American people, even in the time, obviously, of, of difficult economics and things like that. Generally, you'd expect a president to say, okay, we need to sacrifice, here's what we're gonna do. And we've heard a little bit of that from the White House, uh, but, but not nearly enough. So we talked about the 1980s a little bit flippantly at, at first, but what the 1980s revealed is that there is a rough consensus as it related to foreign policy amongst American elites. So we had a strong interest in projecting an ideology of democracy. We were pro-democracy, we were fighting against the communists. We wanted to preserve things like free press, free elections, freedom of speech. And it was clear that we wanted to export those values as part of the conflict in the Cold War. Yes, there were fringe elements. There were people who wanted a military conflict with Russia. There were people who uh, wanted to take a more peaceful approach and denuclearize in the left wing. But generally, there's a pretty broad foreign policy consensus across the two parties. That consensus, I think, is largely gone. You don't have a consistent understanding across the parties about what it means to be an American on the world stage. Within the Republican Party, sort of the America first ideology doesn't fit easily within a foreign policy context. There's a belief within part of that movement 
that maybe free markets are the problem. Or that maybe we don't want to intervene overseas because too many uh, blue collar, middle class, lower class soldiers end up getting killed in those conflicts. That maybe those are just wars for elites to fight while regular people suffer. <clears throat> so I think there's a thread of isolationism within the Republican Party that we haven't seen for quite some time, and it's prominent. Within the Democratic side, the real argument there, I think, for them is, are our values worth exporting? If you think the Constitution is oppressive, if you think that American political structures have really been designed to destroy minorities, if you think maybe elections are part of the problem, then why do you care about exporting your politics to the rest of the world? It's also true, I think it's fair to say, that on the left, there's a pretty strong thread of multiculturalism. This idea that our culture is roughly equivalent to every other culture. And so who are we to push our values on Russians, Ukrainians, whoever it may be throughout the rest of the world? It's just not worth it. And so President Biden is, con is confronting two parties that at their extremes are opposed to any kind of intervention at all. Now, I have to say, maybe the most disturbing part of this, at least that I've come across, is some defense of Putin. You know, that Putin is a standard bearer for traditional cultural values, and that those cultural values are more important than any of these other kind of conflicts that we're talking about, and we should be sympathetic to Putin, or we should be sympathetic to Orban, or Erdogan, or whoever else it may be. And so now, how big are these kinds of thoughts? How many people do we represent here? It's hard to know, but it's, it's way more than zero. And a lot of those folks have pretty, pretty large platforms uh, to speak from. In terms of polling right now, there's pretty broad support for what the president's doing. Now, the only part of this where you see some fracturing is over this question is, is President Biden making the right decisions uh, you know, only 36% of Republicans would say yes to that. But on the whole, they support sanctions. They approve of Zelensky. They disapprove of Russia. They disapprove of Putin. And I think this is good for President Biden. This gives him some flexibility to deal with the situation to some degree. But I think what we're going to run into, and I hope I'm wrong, is that social media will maybe spur people to want us to do more. This is, this is the first social media war, I think true social media war, where Twitter and Facebook and other platforms are giving you real-time information on the battlefield. Now, maybe it's false sometimes, but it's real information. And so we can sit and scroll in our computer and see these hospitals that have been bombed. We can see civilians lying in the streets that are just, have just been killed literally minutes or hours before. To what degree are we willing to sit and watch those kinds of images for two months, four months, six months, a year, two years, before people start to pressure the administration to do more, to institute a no-fly zone, to send NATO troops, to do whatever it takes to sort of restrain this level of violence that we're just not used to seeing. And so it's good that we see the brutality of combat but it may motivate us to make decisions that aren't necessarily strategically sound because of the nature of the emotional impact of that combat. It's also true that social media is spreading a significant amount of misinformation on all sides of the conflict. Um, no matter what you think of the 2016 election, the 2020 presidential election, I think it's inarguable to say that Russia played a significant role in pushing information through social media to disrupt our political process. So this is a multi-year campaign to interject themselves into American politics through manufactured false information on social media. That information has an effect on people. And many of them have become, I think, a little bit more sympathetic as a result. It's also true 
and Glenn would know more about this than I would, that Putin is using these kind of tools to misinform his own public. And so one of our great hopes, I think, is that the Russian people will rise up and put an end to this war. But if they don't know what's happening, we can't necessarily expect them to do that. And so I don't know if we've quite figured out what the potential effects of social media will be as we continue to watch these kind of conflicts take place. It's gonna be enormously complicated, I think. All right, questions. We, we both can take whatever questions you might have. We don't have much time. I know. We're good. We're good. What, what is the rationale behind us not allowing Poland to get mixed? Good, sir. Sure. Because uh, this is uh, depends on location and who is seen as culpable and then supplying the Ukrainians. So the MiG 29s are a fighter jet. Uh, from a few generations ago, uh, they've been moved from Poland to Ramstein Air Base. But the big question is, how do you get them into Ukraine? Uh, and so any act that's seen as something that supports the Ukrainian people on behalf of NATO could be viewed as an act of war. And so if we look back historically, there were um, uh, Churchill was begging Roosevelt for arms during World War II before Pearl Harbor. And so, uh, you know, what the um, United States would do is it would, uh, you know, put planes to the Canadian border and have Canadians, uh, you know, pull them actually across the border as a means of not delivering them from the United States, as a means of keeping the U.S. out of a war with Hitler. And so it seems to me like it's a similar situation. What? Lynn, how does that how does that differ with planes though compared to all the other arms that we're, we're seeing? Yes, because when you get into um, yeah. javelins, anything that's anti-tank, uh, we the United States have supplied Ukraine with 2.5 billion dollars worth of aid, some of it lethal. Uh, and so yeah, Putin has not gone to the extent of saying this is a declaration of war, but the Assumption is that MiG 29s or A 10s or some other form of US aircraft or NATO aircraft would be considered an act of war. But that's hard to know because Turkey may supply uh, anti tank systems, the S 400, uh, to Ukraine. And the irony is the S 400 is built in Russia. Uh, so S 400s would go against Russian S 400s. So. But, but we have been supplying them. A weaponry before the war, so it yes. was not fighter jets. No, that's a distinction. Of Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Well, isn't it also because you can drive those things across the border as opposed to you can't drive a plane across? Exactly. That's the distinction. And so, how are the MiG 29s delivered into Ukraine? Do Ukrainian uh, airmen, you know, get to Germany and then fly them? Where do they land? All of these are considered potential trigger points for uh, a NATO Russia war, which could then become a World War Three, the nightmare scenario. What, what level of support do you see uh, Putin getting at home? I, you see demonstrations in the street, but on the other hand, I see say that that there's considerable support for what he's doing. It's a, it's a bit of both, and it's hard to know. He has locked down Russian media very heavily beyond Russia Today, Sputnik, Pravda, that are all heavily slanted. Uh, I was interviewed by Sputnik once upon a time, and they, they're always trying to spin us as you know, something distinct. But um, Russia has different sets of social media, V-Contact, Odnap Plus Nikki, for example. So they're typically outside of Facebook, outside of Twitter, outside of Instagram, although typically on TikTok. Uh, and so, um, the other side of it, though, is that the average Russians are beginning to understand that like, even though they're getting news from Russia that's very pro Putin, why isn't my MasterCard working? Why is McDonald's shut? Uh, there's kind of a drip from the outside where, you know, this isn't quite what we've seen. And for anyone that remembers the Soviet era, they remember similar type propaganda being put in place. Um, but Putin legitimately has circles of support. Uh, there, when he invaded Crimea and annexed it, the report was that his approval rating skyrocketed to 80%. Uh, 
This is in the aftermath of a successful Sochi Winter Olympics with no terrorist attack, which was the assumption at the time uh, for Kim around Kavkaz, uh, a terrorist group that operates outside out of Chechnya and Dagestan and Ingushetia in the, in the southwest of Russia. Uh, and so it's both. He has a legitimate circle of support, but there's a realization of, of what is happening on the outside. BBC's Russian service is still functioning to some degree, but it's 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 a great question and it's hard to know for sure. So I, I think that um, what we have to keep in mind is how do we prevent Putin from selling this war better to his own people? And so even though it may be morally correct to put in play something like a no-fly zone, complicated in all of its ways. He could then use that to argue this is now a war against NATO. And Russian response to that will differ as opposed to the response as it is right now. And so you want to you want to keep Putin as isolated as you can within his country from his own people to some extent. And so if they can turn on him, all the better. It may cost Ukraine, but it may in the process help save thousands, millions of other people if that conflict expands. So you have this, you have these two obligations. You want to protect human life. You want to protect it in Ukraine, but you also want to protect it in Lithuania and in Poland and other places that could get dragged into a conflict that expands. But that's really where, you know, where politicians are having to make extremely difficult decisions. Um, and it's really where to some extent, you know, regardless of what party they're in, we should pray for them to do well in those decisions because it's good, it's good for the world. Um, you go back to kind of the Berlin Wall thing. They, you know, I have family in Italy and same age as me, and then when the wall went down, they drove two days to go help tear down the wall and sent pieces of the wall. And talking to them now, Facebook and translation, uh, they don't think the United States is doing enough. I know, and you know, this, this has been in their backyard, as, as you mentioned, my mother. The, several generations of wars in Europe. The interesting fact is they said, look what is, well, my cousin said to me is look what, and I'm trying to get your input on it. Sweden and now Finland are showing up to NATO leaders <coughs> who have Russian speaking populations in their country. So I'd be interested to say either one of your takes on those two countries now showing up to NATO meetings. Yes, uh, Finland was forcibly brought into the Russian Empire for about 100 years following the end of the Napoleonic Wars until the, the Russian Revolution that I mentioned, and Finland has since been independent. Uh, Finland is also a very important test case because they were invaded in November of 1939 by the Soviets. The Soviets being about 70 times bigger than the 3 million Finns at the time, and the Finns won. Uh, they had to give up some territory, but they effectively beat the Soviets, but opted for a foreign policy to remain neutral. And so Sweden and Finland have been outside of NATO uh, since its beginnings in 1949. But in 2014, when Russia invaded Crimea and illegally annexed it, there have been pretty significant discussions in both countries to join. On the first point of the United States doing more, as, as Dr. Smith said, it's a very tricky ground. But since World War II, many Europeans worked for the United States to lead, to be out front. When uh, the brutal Yugoslav wars of the early 1990s broke out, it was ultimately the United States that implemented S4 and K4 uh, to bring about an end of those conflicts. We, we, they, signed the Dayton Accords right at wright Patterson Air Force Base to solve Bosnia and Herzegovina to some degree. Uh, and so many Europeans look to the United States and as Dr. Smith noted, it's a difficult position, but there's certainly different things we could do. We probably should have put sanctions in place at least a month earlier than we did. There are more sanctions that could go in place now that could really hurt the Russian economy. Uh, and then it gets into weaponry, and how else to support, but um, it is a key viewpoint from, from many, many European allies. I don't know if you, uh, uh, please. Yeah, aren't we kind of walking though, like a, a, a nuclear holocaust tightrope that if we take the wrong step uh, on either side that we could end up uh, gone? 
that that's the grand danger in all of this because mm -hmm. even with the new start treaty from 2011 the strategic <clears throat> arms reduction treaty there are still 1550 deployable nuclear weapons and then there's an arsenal beyond that uh, on both the russian and the american sides and so if putin argues that nato is now attacking us if we supply mig 29s for example if that's his red line then that's where the real danger comes in uh, how he proceeds with it, it's hard to know, but that's the danger of, of escalating this even more. But having said that, there are over um, 16,000 troops from the West, including Americans, that have signed up to help Ukrainians. Russia has sent in Chechens and Belarusians and now Syrians to fight against the Ukrainians. This is already escalating. And so that's uh, the grand challenge of the tightrope that you, uh, I think, aptly mentioned. Do you but, see any, what odds do you give to some kind of coup happening to take Putin out of the driver's seat? It's probably still fairly low, but it's not minimal anymore. The question is who takes over from Putin? And it's, yes. uh, I mean, in any democratic country, there's a clear line of succession. With Putin, he has a relatively new prime minister, um, Dmitry Mishustin who probably is not going to be a, a president. But beyond that, Dmitry Medvedev, who was the former prime minister, is a candidate, but he was a pawn of Putin. Uh, Valentina Matvienko is another one who, she is the uh, equivalent of our Senate, the head of the Senate, she is what's called the Federation Council. Uh, so there are a lot of people that could take over from Putin theoretically, but chances are it's going to be a bloodbath to see who takes over if someone does take him out. But the other side of it is that he's hugely isolated. He was divorced in 2014, doesn't have a strong inner circle. Those within his cabinet are very much yes men. Uh, he's ousted some of his most prominent people, uh, Alexei Kudrin being noteworthy, who was the finance minister of the year in 2001 in Europe. He was ousted. Uh, Medvedev was ousted. Uh, but that's that's the real tricky part is Putin is just away from people in a bunker somewhere, not in one of his three regular locations. And that's what makes it very tricky. But he's turning 70 soon. If something happens to him health wise, it could be another time in the troubles like 1610 or 1991, at which point there could be a humanitarian disaster in Russia. Uh, our sanctions are hard. They could be harder. And that's that's the real challenging mix that we have. Well, speaking of sanctions, uh, what about the energy uh, uh, domestically, the energy yeah. situation? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think we could have brought to bear those sanctions earlier, honestly. So there's the movement now to limit oil and gas that we bring in from Russia, which I think is significant. Um, Again, I think that the inflation crisis makes it a little bit complicated in putting sanctions in place because it's going to affect American business as well, to some degree. I think we have this thought that if we just sanction them, you're not going to see these sort of ripple effects. But I think the ripples are going to be pretty, pretty drastic. I, you know, I, I don't want to be overly negative, but I don't know how much Americans are willing to sacrifice. But that's really what you're talking about. about. What about our resources? I mean, do we have the resources? We do, and, and, I, and, you can, and I think the best criticism against President Biden is he has not exploited those resources fully at all. Um, he's even limited them through, you know, limiting the Keystone Pipeline and things like that. He could hand out more leases for drilling. He could open up more public land for drilling. So there are things that they can do. And of course, oil functions on a futures market, right? The price of oil is about a bet about the future and what's going to happen. If he can even indicate that we're opening it up, that'll affect the future of those prices, which should bring the price down. But as we talked about, the left wing of his party is pretty doctrinaire when it comes to climate change. They're going to resist this at every point. Um, and I, you know, if you look at President Biden's successes so far as a president, they've happened when he's turned against his own left wing to a degree. And so if he does that, and if he makes a strong stand on energy and drags in some of those independent supporters, and maybe even a few Republicans, his bump will go up. And so I think at some point he'll figure out his own political self-interest is to do this. And 
you know, Biden, he's pretty liberal, but he's not Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, that's not him. <laughs> and so I think at some point he's going to face that way. How interested is Putin in protecting his economy in, in Russia? And how long will it take for some of these sanctions to help American companies pull it out to make his economy either be so crippled or collapse that he's got to do something? Putin prepared for this. He put together a $630 billion war chest, knowing that there would be Western sanctions, that he had to write it out, and that uh, ultimately he'd be able to move forward with an additional 40 million people. Uh, and so uh, the sanctions have been heavier than he would have suspected. Uh, the SWIFT banking system has been significant, but also Visa, MasterCard, Apple Pay, Google Pay, all of these are playing an impact. <clears throat> but we should not underestimate how long an autocrat can muddle through. Just see Venezuela. It should have collapsed a decade ago, and it's still muddling through. Uh, and so the average Russian will suffer <clears throat> But Putin can maintain a semblance of power, and it will push him to China, which will opt to obtain uh, large amounts of oil and keep him propped up to some degree. So chances are he, he could last a year, two years, and that's why sanctions need to get tougher now, uh, because there's going to be the carpet bombing is only going to continue. He's, he's done that time and time again. Uh, since you brought up China, so uh, I. I don't know if we would ever put sanctions on them. Obviously, they have a good relationship with Russia. What do you see them doing? I mean, because I didn't China start their own works off of the Swiss, but they have their own banking that Russia uses. Yes, and, and they can get around the, the Swiss sanctions in that way. Um, the, the central question is how close are Xi and Putin? Uh, are they? Um, Analogous, do they work together heavily, or is this uh, a marriage of convenience? And that's the, and that's the that's the big question there. Because for Xi, there's a level of embarrassment being so closely connected to Putin in something that's so clearly uh, an abrogation of human rights. Uh, and China views Taiwan as as a quote unquote renegade twenty third province that it wants to bring back into the fold. Uh, they would argue they want to do it peacefully. But a lot of people are very concerned about military action against a U.S. ally that's free and democratic and has the free market. Uh, and so this is where it becomes very precarious because Xi is also going to take advantage of the situation. OK, Putin, you can't sell oil, liquid, natural, liquefied natural gas elsewhere. We're going to buy it from you, but this is the price. And so it's going to become very testy uh, as well if Russia continues to suffer. Uh, and China likewise wants to maintain a good uh, balance of trade with the United States. It wants to continue building the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, President Xi's kind of uh, peace from 2013. And this Ukrainian conflict kind of stifles a lot of that. So he's unhappy to some degree as well. And we've seen uh, statements from his foreign minister even speaking out to some degree against uh, Russia's actions. I think we have time for one more. Uh, Russia has a long history of, of failing in terms of offensive maneuvers. Russia has a long history of morale problems. They, they can win by carpet bombing. They can win relatively quickly. The challenge for them will be the long term when, when Russians are, are in a location. Uh, the other thing is this conscription in Russia. So a lot of the people invading are 18, 19, 20 year olds from lower socioeconomic backgrounds that really don't want to be there. Didn't even know they were going in a number of cases. Uh, there's been clear and egregious maintenance issues within the Russian convoy. So uh, the Ukrainians have a real chance, especially if we provide them some help. Uh, but it's a really good question because it's, I think a lot of us expected more of Russia offensively uh, and it just hasn't delivered. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys very much. I believe we're going to stick around. So if you guys have more questions, um, feel free to stick around.
Um, this is probably the longest meeting we've ever had. So we were super excited about this. So we really appreciate it. Um, we always uh, donate a book uh, for the speakers. Reuter is big about literacy. Uh, you guys already have a book this year. So I think we're actually going to have the coach sign this. Um, and this will go into the uh, Green County Library. Um, lastly, and hold your applause, I will not be your host next week. <laughs> Uh, Brandon Huff, I don't know if you remember him, but uh, <laughs> President-elect will be uh, hosting next week, and it'll be uh, Chris McClure on leadership. Um, so we're going to go ahead and uh, stand for the pledge. Coach, you don't mind leading us in the pledge, and we'll follow you. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.